So, um, Lord Montague's donkey and a few other stories. Now, given that we only have 15 minutes, the number of stories is a little bit limited. But all the same, I'm hopefully going to cover most of the ground that I wanted to. So, two things prompted the paper. One is that I've sort of worked alongside quite a few of the pioneers in archaeological geophysics in both France and Britain. So I'm sort of in a reasonably privileged position there. And secondly, what I wanted to try and do was a bit of a reflection on some of the things that we've achieved in the last 50 years and really what is it that we should be looking to do in the next 50. So, oh, that doesn't do anything. Let's do it. So I've got, I had six stories. We're not going to do the wonderful, amazing, we won't ever need to use another method again, GPR. Um, so we start, basically this is your contents page. They managed to cover about five hectares with that and part of the reason for the, in the beginning, on the seventh day, they found the kilns they were looking for. So it took seven days to do five hectares. In 1963, Atkinson thought, oh, let's try resistivity and they used a site in Dorchester on Thames and there they, they, found, they they established a nice survey of a, a ditched enclosure, and that survey was about 25 by 25 metres. It gives you an idea of the sort of scale. I mean, five hectares, actually, at the beginning of magnetometer survey is pretty good going. So, good old days. Basically, when, when I started in geophysics, that was, your, that was the record. And if you wanted a preview of your results, you literally had to draw around the numbers and you could see what you were getting. That was, that was how you previewed it. Resistivity survey initially was this type of survey, which is either a Venn or a double dipole or roll. Basically, it's called leapfrogging electrodes, and you just have to make sure you're not holding them when the person presses the button. <laughs> <laughs> so that was, that was what I started with. Stuff on paper, having to actually mentally interpret the data and that and it actually is a good way to learn because you you understand the numbers you understand what's going on a lot more than if it's gone through a computer so how do we progress from there well lord montague's donkey now this this is a story that goes back to when i was on placement at the ancient monuments laboratory so it's around tony clark had been running it for around about 20 years Alistair Bartlett was still desperately trying to single-handedly survey the entire British Isles. Um, and so one particular week, our job was to, I think I had to do a survey of Hadrian's Wall in Newcastle, followed by a survey of Evesham Abbey. And then at the end of the day, we ended up in, at the end of the week, we ended up in Southampton on Lord Bewley's estate. So this is the estate, and actually I never realised, but I do actually have a photo of the donkey. <laughs> so there's the donkey in the field behind. And so Alistair and I must have turned up that at the end of that week, done a resistivity survey, and then Tony turned up and met us, and Alistair had to go off somewhere, and Tony and I were going to do a gradiometer survey. Now, this was my first ever gradiometer survey. It's really exciting at the time. I can still remember it being exciting. This is the kit that we used. So it's a Fillmore um, magnetometer attached to a chart um, logger. So basically it's a bit of paper in there on a reel, a bit like a lie detector with a pen that goes up and down on it. And the signal comes from the magnetometer, it moves the pen up and down as you walk along. And the thing that turns the drum is this, this device here. So there's a tripod at each end, you've got a cable on a wheel, and you hold the wheel, you hold the cable, and as you walk along, it turns the wheel and it turns the drum. 
And so at the end of the traverse, you go around the other side, you walk back and it turns the drum backwards and it basically draws the line. And they'd managed to get this so that you could offset the line by appropriate amount each time. And that's great. So we'd done our first grid and that was great. And I'd got the hang of it and we went to, to set up the next grid. But what's worth um, knowing at this point, so just remember this setup before um, data processing with this. That was interesting. So I'm just going to show you the cover of um, Tony Clark's book. So this is, this is the data that comes out of it. So these are the tracers. This, these are actual tracers straight out the field. That, and the problem is, if you hold the magnetometer like he's doing there, <laughs> you're going to get bunching in the transects. And to process the data, literally, you had a pair of scissors and a bottle of glue, and you had to cut each trace, separate it, and then glue it back down so it was in the right place. And that was data processing in the mid-1980s. <laughs> but anyway, where does the donkey come in? So we'd moved the tripods onto the next position, and the donkeys, obviously, you can see that they were in the next field when we started surveying there, so don't need to worry about that. But then all of a sudden, a donkey bolted out of a shed which was in the corner of the field, straight through the middle of this wire, and took the whole of the survey kit with it. <laughs> <laughs> and there's one thing that probably nobody knows about Tony Clark that I know, but you'll all know now, is how fast he can run. That's firstly. And secondly, he must have some horse whisperer in him because literally he managed to get the horse calm enough for me to be able to disentangle the entire kit from around its legs. But, so that's my, that was my first experience and last experience of surveying with Tony. But, and we had a really good curry back at his house after that. But the thing that, the thing that's in, that I just wanted to um, draw attention to here is, I mean, that bit of kit at its time, that was... So sort of, that was pretty new. That was quite innovative in terms of what they'd done. They'd, they'd designed all of that so that that would work. And this was a way of increasing the rate at which we could move from doing the five hectares in seven days to maybe, you know, ten hectares in seven days. And that, it was all working towards trying to increase the amount of data and data quality. I mean, just after we did... So the donkey would have been okay. The second story. Okay, the stones, some clouds, and an Arabian night. So the second, the other part, one of the other parts of my um, year out from university was spent at a place called the National Centre de Recherche Geophysique at Garchy in France. And one of the things that I was quite fortunate to be able to do there was I went out to do a survey with Albert Hess on... This is Albert, on a site at a place called Malaya, Malaya which is in, south, in the south of the Sharjah of Emirate. Now, before we went out there, I had a chat, I had an opportunity to, Albert had collected some samples, and so he'd asked me to test them because he was, couldn't understand the results he was getting. Samples were just some stones, so I collected the stones, sorted them by colour, because that was about the limit of my geology. Um, <laughs> and stuck them in a susceptibility meter. And these black stones saturated the instrument. They were literally um, magnetite. They were just solid magnetic material. The rest of them were pretty much nothing. So we knew that on this site there was one type of stone that was particularly magnetic. So if we were looking at responses here, we could reasonably assume if we were getting high magnetic responses, they were either going to be from burning or from that. The other thing that we had, which relates, so those are the stones, this relates to the clouds. We had this piece of equipment. Now, that's called an EM-15, which probably nobody's ever seen in their life. <laughs> but an EM-15 is a magnetic susceptibility meter. It's got about a 40 centimetre depth of detection. Um, it's made of wood. And we had the Garshi like to invent things, so they made the handle and the little reading thing on the top. But the problem that we had was... We went out there in February. I mean, it's nice and cool there. It only goes up to about 35 degrees in the shade. <laughs> but every time a cloud goes over the sun, the temperature drops by over 10 degrees because it's still February. So we had to basically 
orientate all our traverses and use that bit of cardboard to actually protect the sensors from the change in sunlight because the sensors are in little metal canisters and obviously being solenoids they're entirely sensitive to temperature change and the readings just jumped all over the place. So that again a little bit of innovation on the part of the French there for me. But you can see this is a, an example plot again which was hand produced by me in some digger hostel when I was digging in Southampton and writing this up. But what we've got is there's some nice high readings. These are the ones that they thought might be tombs, because we're basically tomb raiding here. The emir had employed us to go and raid the tombs and find treasure. Um, so this is one of their trenches. Um, so they weren't sure whether that was a tomb and that was a tomb. This is definitely a tomb, because we opened it. It had a broken roof. It turned out the emir had already raided that, because he had all the treasure in his palace already when we went to see him. <laughs> this one, though is not. And the, this is caused by these magnetic stones. And if we do a little bit of a magnetic susceptibility profile across that, you can see the little dotted things are where the black stones are. We've got a layer of black stones that's naturally running across the site. This is a well that's been dug through it and all the material's been thrown over the top. So you're looking at the actual upcast of this magnetic layer of stones into, into fills around the hole. So it just goes, and it sort of goes to show again, you can see as the layers come near the surface, how the EM15 is um, responding to them, and that saturated the equipment at that point, just going over where they, they were near the surface. So the point here is that um, it's important to look in more than one dimension, and we have a tendency to look at geophysics in just, the, in just plan. Okay, so the other thing that happened on this site was, having done all this, and for the person presenting the geochemical thing at the end, this is quite interesting. We turned up one morning, and this is the Arabian night. Now, it was, we, turned, we left at five, we turned up at about six for work, or half six. The dew was just rising, and one morning when we turned up, all the, basically all the salts in the walls in the town around Malaya, which was buried under there, plus all the salts in the, in the tombs and everything just came to the surface and literally painted the features on the ground like outlines of chalk, which was, and I couldn't persuade the surveyor to stop surveying and come over and survey everything and it disappeared within half an hour and it never came back again. It's a bit like the... But you can see, really, really striking just the st all that stuff that we've been slogging our guts out in, in hot weather to, to map just appeared in the middle of a nice cool morning. Right, tale of a two, pro two probe or arrays. So this is a bit of a resistivity story. This is, so at Garchy, I'm working for the French, and there's a tendency with the French to be maybe a little bit purist. This is a, so this is a massive, this was about a one kilometre long resistivity survey I did for some um, uh, water detection looking for aquifers. So, but this is the research centre. Fantastic place to work. They pretty much invented everything. But the question we had, the argument we had with them was the British way of doing resistivity survey versus the French way. So when I arrived there, we did this in the middle of a forest, moving the electrode one at a time. It was really painstaking. It took us probably a, a week to do what we'd do in a day with one of those. I said, why can't you use one of those? Ah, the problem with that is it doesn't give us a resistivity meet. It doesn't give us a res resistance reading. It doesn't actually tell you the actual resistance because the way you're using it, it doesn't. So this is the problem. I won't go bore you with the equation, but that's the equation that causes the problem. And this is the issue. The, the actual ma This is the, the two probes that move around, and these are the two that stay still. And the way in which the manual says to use it is you, when you've got, because obviously you run out of cable, so you've got to move these during a survey. And what the manual said when you moved them was to leave those in place, move those, and move them backwards and forwards until you got the same reading that you had previously. But that ruins the actual equation which gives you the resistance. So that's what the French didn't like, and also it's why we have, in a lot of surveys up until I sort of tried to get Roger Walker to change his manual, um, we kept getting problems with matching the edges of survey data because we were changing the actual way in which that equation works, which is to do with the distance between the electrodes. So in the end, what I thought was, 
given that we assume that the distance between these two is infinity, why don't we just make the distance between these two infinity? That goes away, and then we don't have a problem, because the only thing we're measuring is there, and we've got resistance. But would the French still use it? No. <laughs> so finally, on to the Big Bang effect. And this is really sort of a, a quick look back and a look forward. I mean, we've, I've alluded to the, the volume of data that we've been recording. And obviously, this was, you'll remember, this was the, the way in which if you had a big site, geophysics wasn't quick, very quick in the mid-90s or early 90s after PPG-16. We literally had to do samples of sites because we couldn't cover the ground quick enough. Nowadays, that would be a day's work. I mean, that could, just doing that sample took us four weeks. Um, and OK, here you can see you pick up bits of enclosure and stuff, and you can see what's going on. It's sort of, it's a bit like trenching with geophysics. But we used to do scanning to find things, just looking at the readings. And then, then we would focus on those areas to survey. But now we can cover a much, much larger area. And, the, the, the que and again, just going back to what we're trying to achieve. So this is a, res this is a, a survey that I did as part of my dissertation. This is, a, this is part of a Roman fort. This is a resistance survey. This is a conductivity survey. Now, OK, the conductivity survey isn't quite as pretty as the resistivity survey, but it's still identifying all the same targets that are present. The difference is that this bit of kit is a lot easier to move across the ground quicker and collect data to provide targets. And so there's a couple of thoughts that I just wanted to leave you with. Um, really, the driving factors over the last 50 years have prioritised anything that basically encompasses an increased data volume of data collection. So resistivity was left... When resistivity could no longer keep up with magnetometry, it became the poor cousin. But at the beginning, you know, it was fairly balanced in terms of the amount of resistivity to magnetometry we did. But once magnetometry tore ahead, we just did magnetometry because we could cover the areas quick enough, and that was the priority. But there's a question in my mind over whether there's more information in the resistivity that we can use to help interpret archaeological sites that we're losing because the, the drive is still just to create systems that collect faster and bigger amounts of data. And secondly, that systems that could, could help improve Are being left behind. So had this had this bit of kit in the mid in the mid 80s when we tested it there, and it was published in Tony's book as being appropriate, but still not embraced within mainstream archaeology. So nobody is picking the ideas up. And one real question is, we need in the next 50 years to get the ideas that are in the universities and sort of the geophysics units to the people who are the decision makers and get them into get the people to want that data. I mean, if you go back to that first survey, that first magnetometer survey, they wanted to do that. They didn't know how to find these two kilns. The archaeologists really wanted it. They contacted the geophysics person and got it in. And it's getting that breadth of understanding beyond just one method to the, to the wider profession. So I'll leave you with that.